Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Hartford Astronomy Group. Particularly if you're a new person to us, I'd like to extend a very special welcome to you. It's lovely to see so many of you here. And also to the people who are on Zoom, it's lovely to see you too. I know we had a few technical difficulties, but we hope they're all overcome now. So for everybody who is new to us, the format of the evening is after a few announcements that I'm giving now. Um, I'll pass over to John, who will give you a talk about the night sky. After that, John will pass over to Jerry, who will introduce tonight's speaker. After that, I'll have a few closing um, remarks, and we would hope to finish around about 9.30 to quarter to 10. During the talks, there will be opportunities for you to ask questions. For those of you at the university, you can ask them live. Just give us a chance to get the microphone to you so that the people on Zoom can hear the question. For those of you on Zoom, you can join in too. If you could submit your questions via the chat facility, then we'll see them here and we will read them out. University people, um, I'm sure if you haven't found them already, the toilets are just outside the door and on the left-hand side. Can I ask also for the comfort of everybody around you, if you've got a mobile phone, can you switch it to silent or some other form so it doesn't interrupt the meeting? And similarly, if um, you have a question, can you keep it to the end of the talks as a you know, respectful um, gesture towards our speakers? We're not expecting to have a fire alarm practice, so if the alarm does go off, please exit safely and congregate on the car park so that we can check everybody is safe. For those of you on Zoom, could I ask that you keep your hands away from the space bar um, and keep yourself on mute, otherwise we'll have some rather interesting additions to our conversations. So that's enough from me. I'm now going to hand over to John and he's going to tell us about the night sky. Ah. Uh. Oh, that seems to be working. All right, hello. Uh, I'm going to try, probably fail, but I'm going to try and go through this very quickly. Uh, OK, so starting as always with the moon, usual phases. We actually have managed not to do this on a new moon. So we've got the first quarter in the 17th and it goes through its usual progress. It's a little bit more busy for the Moon this month if you're interested. We get to within three degrees of Jupiter tonight. When I looked it was too cloudy, you couldn't see anything. Tomorrow night you're going to get three degrees from the Pleiades and we've got a total eclipse coming up on the 8th of April which I will briefly speak about later. Okay, so this was a nice image I thought of the Moon under the Pleiades. The moon is about half a degree wide, so theoretically that should be six degrees, sorry, six times the width of the moon below the Pileides, and I think that's a lot less, but I still like the image I kept it in. Okay, a lot of planets aren't really happening uh, this month for us. Uh, you might be able to see Venus in the pre-dawn sky, Mars still out there coming around the sun, it's getting, getting closer. Uh, and Saturn is moving to the west of the Sun. Neptune ends up with a conjunction on the 17th. It's a real shame because I was looking at this in Solarium and Saturn is going past several of these planets but you can't see it. it's happening in the daytime. What we have got is... Oops. Oh yeah, sorry. Mercury. Mercury, right, I always say this every week. Uh, every month that I do this, do not look at Mercury while the sun is in the sky, wait for it to go down, incredibly dangerous. Uh, it's moving away from the sun, it's going to hit its maximum elevation around about the 24th of the month. It's pretty bright, I mean it's going down to minus one, but obviously the sky is going to be fairly light for a lot of that, but it is, it's definitely worth a look. Uh, after the 24th it's going to head back towards the sun, and uh, we're going to lose it towards the end of the first week, April, second week in April. So you've got, we've got a window to see it, which is nice. Uh, Jupiter uh, at Uranus and the Moon, well, these two have been forming this line for months now, and it's really easy way to find them in the line, uh, line between Jupiter and the Pleiades. Uh, <coughs> sorry. 
The moon tomorrow night is going to form that absolutely fantastic pattern. It's a very crescent moon. It's only about three or four days old, uh, but it'd be well worth looking. And if you want, <coughs> sorry, if you want to find Uranus, it is just about halfway between the moon and Jupiter. If the clouds let us see it, Jupiter will be the first thing you see, brightest star in the sky. Jupiter's setting earlier and earlier. It starts at about 23, around about 11 o'clock. It's going to set. It's going to come down at 21 uh, to nine o'clock. It's heading up towards Uranus, but they're going to disappear from the sky before they actually get clo very close. But still, it's an opportunity to find it if you're like me and can't find anything at night. Okay, we also got a comet going on. So this is uh, the really wonderful name 12P Pontus Brooks. It's a 71 year comet. It, it's going to be about perihelium, I think, oh sorry, closest to the Earth, rather than closest to the Sun, about the 10th of April. Uh, gets down to magnitude 5.4, so uh, you can see it in a dark sky if you've got binoculars and you want to use a, uh, something like this to work out where it is, you'd have a good chance of finding it. This is done on the, as I said, on the 10th of April. Okay. Now, not much in the planets. What's happened in the last month? So, uh, Mimas, which is one of the major moons of Saturn, they were doing an investigation into why it was so different from Enceladus. It turns out they don't think it is actually all that different from Enceladus. Uh, I've got to say, the reason I put this picture is I actually like this picture. But I also want to crack a joke about that's not a space station, that's a small moon. Because uh, it does look like the Death Star. Okay, so it turns out it's got a rocky ocean, or they believe it's got a rocky ocean, uh, about 12 to 18 miles under, sorry, rocky ocean. It's got a liquid ocean, 12 to 18 miles under, the, under its crust. And uh, just like Enceladus, it's kept liquid by the tidal forces of Saturn. And there's an awful lot of liquid water, a surprising amount of liquid water out in the outer solar system. And you can see why people are getting optimistic about finding life out there. So the Euclid mission uh, survey began. Euclid was a satellite that was launched uh, about July last year. And it's going to spend the next six years mapping out galactic clusters to work out where the concentrations of dark matter ha is in the universe. And it hopefully will give us a better understanding of uh, dark matter, which is one of the major cosmological puzzles at the moment. Japan launched, tested a new rocket, the H3. They tested it a few months ago and it blew up, tested it, worked fine. I really include this because I think JAXA are our most incredible space agency. They do some wonderful work when you look into them. They're not sung as much. We, we hear about NASA, we hear about the uh, European Space Agency, we hear about Roscosmos usually badly. But we never hear that much about JAXA, and they are incredible. So credit them. There was also there was another satellite that was launched, uh, sorry, rocket that was launched yesterday and blew up on takeoff. So more, more the SpaceX model for them. Okay. So New Glenn is upright for once. This rocket is huge. It's 98 meters tall, which is about 12 meters shorter than a Saturn V. First stage is reusable, second stage isn't. It's, from my point of view, it's going to be competitor to the Falcon Heavy, 45,000 kilos to low Earth orbit compared to 63,000 kilos. Uh, it's quite interesting the, the process that Blue Origin take. SpaceX, chuck it in the air, learn something about it. Blue Origin's more like NASA, we always think of NASA being, you test everything, you test everything again, you test them all separately, you test them all together, and when you launch, it should work. But that's going to launch in August, and currently they're testing pressure and loading, but they're going to launch two satellites due about August. Okay. Uh, now, SpaceX, Blue Origin, it's about making access to space cheaper, and uh, Varda Space Industries returned the capsule with some antiviral drugs that they grew in zero G, or micro G for the pedantic among us. Now, this is something I, 
that really would be incredibly expensive without companies like SpaceX and, Bl and Blue Origin and various others bringing down the space as, uh, the cost of launches. So we may get new generations of drugs coming out of this. So if you've got as much grey hair as me, you probably remember Supernova 1987A. Happened in the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's the closest observed uh, supernova to Earth since 1604. So it's, it's generated a lot of interest, a lot of science, and they've been watching the, uh, the nebula form. JWST found the neutron star, the remains of the uh, star that actually blew up. We had a few lunar landers. They have one thing in common, they both ended up on their sides. So the good news about SLIM, which was a JAXA mission, that landed, that landed a couple of months ago, but it toppled over or it came down, and they're worried about the solar panels pointing the wrong way. It, they did manage to revive it. Uh, so they are getting some science out of it, and hopefully it will survive a few lunar nights. Uh, Intuitive Machines Odyssey Lander, it's the first lander that uh, America has put on the moon since Apollo 17. Now, it fell over. It's a very tall machine, but that's not why it fell over. Uh, they discovered just before landing that they hadn't uh, enabled the laser rangefinder. The safety equipment was still on, which they couldn't turn off remotely. I think it was a hard switch rather than a software switch. They tried something that NASA had on board, which didn't work. It might have worked, but they, it couldn't communicate with the computer that was landing the craft. So it came down with optics and I don't know what. Had too much lateral speed. The leg buckled and it toppled over. And it's actually toppled over uphill. It's not its height that caused it to topple. Uh, so what they've, uh, the problem is the solar panels again are pointing the wrong way, but they are getting some power. They're not sure it's going to survive the lunar night though, if they'll be able to top the battery up enough. And the antenna, some of them point the wrong way, so they're getting signal bounced off the moon, which makes it noisy, which reduces your bandwidth. It's at the South Pole. I think it's the first landing at the South Pole. Odd, uh, intuitive machines who landed it. Uh, are saying it's an unqualified success, which I think is overstating it, but you know, space is hard and I hope the manned ones don't topple over. Right, so China. China has named its lunar lander Megzuhu, which means dream vessel, because China is committing to landing people on the moon by 2030. Now I remember a talk Jerry gave, I think last year or the year before, where he said that there's a very good chance that the next person to land on the moon will actually be carrying a Chinese flag. And although Artemis III is scheduled to land before them, I can see they're getting delayed. Which of course brings us to the NASA budget request. 25 billion, <coughs> which well, I was gonna say sounds like a lot of money, it is a lot of money. Uh, but it's exactly what they had last year, so it's effectively a cut, and unfortunately they cut a lot of stuff. 5% uh, cut in Hubble, which they're going to say they're going to get by merging the control with JWST. The Chandra X-ray telescope is devastated. It's 40% cut for 2025, dropping down to 93% cut by 2029. They're only spending 60 million on it a year, and on 25 billion, that's not a lot of money. So it does make you wonder. They're saying that it's because it has heating problems, but a lot of people on the, uh, the science side are saying it's not true. It's, it's well managed. I saw SLS has had its budget cut by somewhat, by something like 7%. <clears throat> the Mars sample return mission looks pretty doubtful. They haven't made a, haven't made a decision yet, but the vibes seem to be not good. There's a lot being cut, an awful lot being cut. I do wonder if Artemis is going to be the current generation's equivalent of the space shuttle where everything got sacrificed for it. Okay, so next month, <coughs> we've got the spring equinox on the 19th. Hopefully we'll, the rain will stop. We've got a total eclipse on the 8th of April. Now, Anyone who's spoken to me for more than five minutes probably already knows 
that Fee and I are intending to go out and see the solar eclipse this time. In fact, if you spoke to me for more than five minutes, I've probably told you twice. So, <laughs> didn't speak to me for five minutes. Okay, so we're, we're actually going to be where that yellow star, fittingly in Texas, I hadn't thought of that, the yellow star in Texas is a small town called Waco, where nothing bad has ever happened, <laughs> ever. Actually, if you are wondering, it is that Waco. It genuinely is. And if you don't know Waco, is look up the branch of the Vidian cult. Anyway, this eclipse tended to be the most observed eclipse in, in history because it's going through a lot of population centers. If anyone's wondering, America is just unfair. Their last eclipse was 2017, and the one before that was 1979. Our last eclipse was 1999, and the one before that was 1927 which uh, actually was the year before my father was born. We, get, we don't get, uh, sorry, they get another one in 2044 and we don't get another one for 2090 and I do know why they're getting so many more than us but it's still great. There is one in Spain in 2026 which will be shorter but easier to get to. Okay, right. Starship 3 or Starship Launch 3 may happen tomorrow. I don't know the FAA have given them approval to launch. They are, but they, they, that's the earliest they will launch is tomorrow. They've already cleared the accident report from the previous one. And they're going to try a few different things this time. They're going to try and relight the Raptor engine in space. It's a suborbital flight, but it will get to space. They're going to try and launch the, uh, sorry, relight the Raptor engines in space. The next bit is really hard to say. They are going to open the payload doors, po payload bay doors, and I keep wanting to say open the pod bay doors. <laughs> it's so hard not to say that. They're also going to do a propellant transfer. So they're going to move cryogenic fuel between two of the internal tanks. Never been done before with cryogenic fuels. Absolutely needed by Starship and the Starship version of the Lunar Lander, although that will be between two sh spaceships. There is a $50 million prize from NASA for the first company to achieve this. So good luck. They're actually going to come down now in the Indian Ocean. It's not going to be a landing. They're going to hit the ocean, though they may try to slow down before they get the ocean. Always entertaining. If it goes up, it's fantastic. If it blows up, it's possibly even better. OK, so finally, my favourite bit of the talk, uh, the ph photography section, their pictures. This one's from Stephen, who uh, I really like these. He did these based on the talk last month, Professor Alan Davis' talk on rainbows and halos. And I like these, firstly, because they are actually really nice pictures. I really do like them. But I also think it shows... Stephen has an awful lot of expertise. I don't think he's got any other pictures this month, but he has an awful lot of expertise. But even with just a camera that he took these with, you can take good pictures of the sky. And, you know, you, you, you can progress. So this one's from Martin, who, who usually gives this talk. This is the Jellyfish ne Nebula, 5,000 light years from Earth. It's the remains of a supernova. Uh, they, they found an object in the southern part of it, I don't know what direction up that is, uh, that they think is the neutron star or it's spinning, so the pulsar that is the remains of the star that formed this. Okay, uh, Peter, Peter does some incredibly difficult pictures. I mean, this one's 38 hours. I'm not even going to pronounce that because it's just a letters and numbers. This, this is a, uh, I'm slightly confused on this one. I think it was, they thought it was a planetary nebula, then they thought it was ionised interstellar gas, and now they're going back towards the planetary nebula. I think they think it's a planetary nebula in there, but they need better images. Okay, another one from Martin. This is the monkey head nebula. Now this isn't the remains, this is the star. This is a star forming region, and it's six and a half thousand light years from Earth. It is creating stars at a quite incredible rate. Uh, and the stars are very energetic. They're blasting out gas, which is actually driving out all of the gases that form the nebula. So, ungrateful children, I suppose. 
Okay, and finally another one from Peter. This is a planetary nebula, so that's the other end of the scale. This is where, where stars go to die, or what stars become when they die. Uh, it's at one arc minute across. It was, <laughs> this is called the Riddle Nebula, and helpfully Peter told me that the Riddle Nebula is called this because it was discovered by Dave Riddle, not Tom Riddle, Dave Riddle. Uh, and it's only about 20 years ago it was confirmed to be a true planetary nebula. Okay, so some fantastic, as always, some amazing pictures. All right, so any questions before I hand back to Jerry? Good, because I probably couldn't answer them. <laughs> Thank you. much for that okay um, I did take a photo of a rainbow myself recently um, while I was in Lister Hospital so uh, I got a good view because it was taken from the eighth floor of that um, did any of you see that the rainbow a few days ago okay um, I mean it was lovely coincidence to uh, to have seen that just after last week uh, last month's uh, presentation so that was all about rainbows and uh, i'm sure that we all learned a lot more about the subject than we previously knew um, i suspect that this month's presentation is going to be sort of the other way around there will be an awful lot that we don't know about um, modified gravity uh, and so on. But uh, we have an expert to tell us all about it. Ruth Gregory is a theoretical professor of physics and uh, head of department at King's College London, which is where Arthur C. Clarke did his degree uh, many years ago. This is a subject that you can go into in absolutely huge detail and you can study for years and not know all about it. But don't worry, I have told Ruth that we're after a presentation that can be acceptable by an audience of uh, ordinary people um, but do want to, to know more about this. So, Ruth, can I ask you to come up? So, those of you who've been around a bit longer will see that I have a lot of uh, backgrounds from the US. Um, I'm actually going to be in Dallas for the eclipse. I have family there, so I'm heading over in about 10 days. First of all, going to a research retreat at a, a, um, a ranch near Houston and then off up to my cousins up in Dallas. So uh, we, I was over for the 2017 eclipse as well, which we saw in Nebraska, again with my cousin. So we are, we just, we are sort of definite eclipse chasees. Okay, so um, I'm Ruth Gregory. Uh, you heard me being introduced. I'm at King's College London. And I was asked to talk about modifying gravity, going beyond Einstein theory. Um, and I sometimes like the, the sort of subtitle, which is really the pizza nobody ordered. So this used to be very much uh, the, the sort of thing that used to happen in the States when you uh, didn't like someone, you pretended to that they were ordering a pizza so that pizzas would arrive. At their, at their place of abode or study or whatever. Um, but it very much sums up the state of our universe. Now, um, I'm going, the, the approach that I'm going to take is probably going to be more focusing on like the evidence for, for this um, unwelcome pizza, in a sense, as well as sort of saying a little bit about uh, you know, how we might test theories of modified gravity and very briefly saying one of the theories that I was involved in a little while back. 
Um, so some of this is going to be very basic and very familiar, but I think people sitting there always feel quite smug when they know what's going on, so there's no, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but also, by starting, you know, starting at the beginning of the story, I think it sometimes uh, helps me at least, because it always reminds me like why I got into this in the first place, and so that's what makes it fun. And in a sense, this is so, if you, if you haven't already guessed, Einstein's like one of my heroes. <laughs> um, and uh, this is, I think, one of, you know, the, the most, it, it's very true, I think, about the universe, but it, it's also just a very strange thing to say. It, and it is so true. The more, the more that you sort of look, you, you keep seeing puzzles, and then you say, but hang on. That bit I might not understand, but look at what I can explain. So this is really going to be the theme of uh, the narrative of the talk. So just to give a, a brief outline, um, I'm just going to have a very general uh, view, it's an overview of cosmology. I'm sure this is going to be very familiar to, to uh, such old hands. Oh, I'm not supposed to say that anymore. That's ages, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, what's the word? <laughs> Experience, that's it. Uh, um, and I will talk about the evidence for um, acceleration and dark energy, um, and then really start just delving a little bit into the mystery of dark energy. Um, and, and here, you know, really this is probably the bit where I'm quite most questions are probably directed there. Uh, and then at the end, I'll sort of come and back and think, you know, how can we actually check all this? And some of the things that I guess I'm quite excited about at the moment. So again, apologies for starting at the beginning, but to me, I guess I see cosmology as we know it, sort of beginning with Copernicus by sort of taking this self-centered view of the Earth being at the core of everything and beginning to put it as a more objective way and saying, well, maybe that's not the case, and maybe the sun is at the center. Um, and of course, uh, the, the sort of beginning of things as a science, to me, I feel like modern physics begins with Newton, um, who, it's not just because of the Principia and about his laws of motion. I think speaking as a theoretical physicist, what I see in the way Newton was approaching his study of, the, of natural philosophy was he brought mathematics into it. Before people, you know, would, it was all about, well, this law, that law, or this happens. But he started to write things mathematically. So we know this as an inverse square law. But in fact, he wrote that much more in the sense of the calculus and a gravitational potential, which is far closer to general relativity. In a sense, all general relativity is, is kind of making that space tiny rather than sort of more rigid. Um, and so, you know, with um, Newtonian gravity, we can actually get started with cosmology, but I think the, the roots of thinking about our universe rather than just the sort of heavens probably started with Thomas Wright in the mid 18th century with his concept of the island universe. And so we kind of recognize this as our galaxy, and I'm sure he was inspired by the Milky Way. And again, you know, what's interesting is Newton could have written down the cosmology that we have today pretty much. Um, because one of the things that you have, if you have Newtonian gravity, one of the things that's interesting about gravity is it has, as we would say in physics, long wavelength instabilities. So if you try to put lots and lots of uh, particles together, then they attract each other under gravity. But you might think, as probably Newton did, if he did think about it, well, if they're all evenly spaced, all the forces balance out. But one of the things that is a, an indispensable tool in modern physics is what we call perturbation theory. 
and if you just give a little click to one of those particles it'll then it won't just return and stabilize back to where it was it's going to keep moving you will have an over density and then everything starts to collapse in it was called a genes instability and it persists in Einstein gravity as well um, and so this really tells you that cosmology is not static. Anyway, so why didn't Newton do it? Well, I think nobody even thought about applying these sorts of ideas to the universe. So, I mean, now we get back to Einstein and our universe present. And of course, the real difference between, I guess, uh, the Newtonian picture and our modern picture of, of uh, gravity or of our universe is Einstein's relativity. So by using just basically two postulates, the speed of light, everybody agrees on it, and that nobody's special, I guess that's the way I usually like to sum it up, um, you can get all of the transformations, all of the laws, of, if you like, of special relativity. And this tells you that really you don't have space and time, you have space-time. And we're kind of used to, the, to sort of time as a dimension because we put graphs, we plot interest rates or stock. Well, that's a, an old one of the FTSE, or is it a new one? Um, in time. And that's really just a visualization of time as another dimension. Of course, it's different. Uh, we perceive it differently. But it really is just another dimension. So Einstein gravity, um, just again, I, no, I, I do, I can't seem to resist writing the odd formula down. That's just the way it goes. <laughs> um, so Einstein's gravity kind of replaces. So we, we always want to label things. You know, we want to sort of say X, Y, Z, longitude, latitude, altitude. We kind of want to assign labels to where we are. And um, and we can still do that with Einstein gravity. It's just those labels don't necessarily mean anything or nothing rigid. And, and you know, they're all kind of relative. So um, you might remember the Pythagoras theorem. The square of the hypotenuse is the sum of the squares of the two sides of a right angle triangle. Well, that's only true in flat space. And so what we do in general relativity is we replace that with something just a little bit more relative. So we say that distances locally aren't quite like Pythagoras. Angles of a triangle don't necessarily add up to 180 degrees. And so we allow our space-time to distort, and that's general relativity. What distorts the space-time? Well, it's matter. So this is, again, the, the grid is meant to represent our rigid idea of labeling things. Um, and if you curve this grid, then your motion also curves. So that's a, a sort of meant to be a pictorial way of viewing uh, the, the way that we describe gravity. But it's, it is just really thinking about how do, you, how do you sort of generalize something that's sort of very, very sort of straight and rigid. Um, and this is more or less what you're led to as the simplest possible thing. So if you apply Einstein gravity to the universe as a whole, uh, then you actually get something very simple. Now, this is, again, in physics, we start to try and say, what is the essence of something? We don't immediately jump into the detail. We're not interested in Hartford or in London or in the US or in Britain. Uh, we're interested in a big picture, so we kind of you know, f blur things out. And we say, well, actually, if we look out at the universe, it more or less looks the same no matter where we look, which is isotropy. And then we use this Copernican principle saying that we're nowhere special, which is homogeneity. And those two assumptions tell us that the Einstein geometry is very, very simple. It is just a particular 
uh, type of s spatial surface, in this case this would be a sphere, that can change its size in time. So that distance, the distances sort of grow in time. And the surface, the usual picture is blowing up the surface of a balloon. And the further away something is, sort of the, the faster it, it recedes from you. So everything is encoded in this one little function r of t. And that's called the scale factor. So that satisfies a very simple equation. Again, I know you probably sort of think, oh god, equations, for me, these are, these are my babies. You know, this is beautiful to me. <laughs> oh, there's people, sort of, uh, um, yeah, anyway. Uh, uh, babies always look beautiful to their mothers. So, <laughs> so, so this is the equation that that scale factor obeys. It's actually super simple. It's just saying that the rate of change squared, admittedly, is related to the energy density in the universe. And there's an extra term there in curvature, which you've probably seen before. But this, this is really about as simple as it gets. And it's also related to, to Newtonian gravity, because all you see is energy, whereas, you know, Einstein gravity would want to sort of include space as well as time-like things. And so again, just as a reminder, the curvature tells you whether your universe is, uh, the top is, is closed, it's round, the bottom is flat, and the one in the middle is open, it's hyperbolic. And this tends to tell you whether your universe will re-collapse or not. And again, you know, this, this really has no real meaning for us because they, we're talking of, again, many billions of years, but um, it always reminds me of a good story of um, one of my colleagues a long time ago gave a talk about, about the sun, said, oh, well, it, eventually, five billion years, it'll become a red giant, and a student came up at the end and said, was that, was that five billion or was it five million? He said, oh, it was five billion. Oh, that's all right then. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, well, I mean, what does it matter? Um, so we, we kind of, one of the nice things is on top of that picture, that very simple picture, we then start to go in and we take, if you like, you know, when you go to the optician and they put all these things that makes everything blurry and then take bits out and say, is that a bit clearer? This is what we gradually do with cosmology. We gradually sort of paint more structure on step by step. And so we sort of use thermal physics. We then use slightly more sophisticated statistical physics with bringing in some concepts from quantum mechanics. And then, of course, we get back early enough that we start to use uh, quantum field theory. And then we get to this is the bit that, you know, my lot play with, we get right back sort of very near the beginning where we really start being, you know, exploring and, and being much less sure about what we have. So our universe, I think I'm pretty clear that we understand it from maybe less than a second, uh, when, from when the universe was, let's say, about a second old, down to now, 13.7 billion years, we feel we pretty much understand that evolution, um, and the bit that comes before is the bit that we're not so sure about, but of course the bit that comes before is what sets everything else in motion. So here, the things to focus on and things to, that I'll come back to are the cosmic microwave background, which is a sort of afterglow, if you like, of the Big Bang, um, on which the universe is almost exactly homogeneous, but there are slight wrinkles. Then the other thing to notice is right at the end, the trumpet is beginning to flare out. So that's kind of the important thing about um, accelerated expansion. And then the bit in the middle <laughs> is sort of where, where we're slowly beginning to try and chip away at observationally, starting from 
the microwave background forward and going further and further back in redshift. So beginning to sort of, doesn't not really close that gap, but uh, starting to fill in the picture. So I usually like to liken cosmology to uh, Sherlock Holmes. We can't run the universe again and again to test all of these. Normally what we want to do, like at the LHC, we know we sort of have a way of describing how two protons collide. We just do it again and again and again and build up a whole load of pictures, a lot sort of statistics about the observations. Here we've got one experiment, one universe, and a bunch of evidence that we have to collect and collate. And then we have to see what is consistent with our evidence and what is not. So we eliminate the impossibles. So that's why I like to think of it as, as Sherlock. The observational pillars that we use, uh, we use redshifts. So redshifts of galaxies. We use abundance of light elements. I won't actually be focusing on that one. We use the microwave background. We use, again, distribution of galaxies. And these are the sort of various pillars that tell us about matter in the universe, so those parts of the pizza. So the microwave background, that's sort of said that was the afterglow of the Big Bang, it's usually nicely described as. Uh, that, again, that forms, obviously the universe was very hot when it, when you go back to the very beginning. Um, and, you know, initially it's some particle soup that we're actually not sure about. Then it comes to a soup that we're a bit more sure about, a quark gluon plasma. Then we start getting identifiably uh, protons, neutrons. Then we get that period of light element synthesis, uh, which gives us information about how many, um, how much, how many photons, how many light quanta there are relative to the, to the protons and neutrons. Um, and then there's, that's the first three minutes. Then you've got a few hundred thousand years. And uh, f during that time, you've just got this very hot plasma that's gradually cooling. And then eventually it gets so cool, electrons and protons start, and the nuclei start to recombine into atoms and molecules, at which point the light can travel freely. Because when you have this gas of nuclei and electrons, light just keeps bouncing off everything and it's a, a very optically thick um, material, but then it becomes optically thin and then suddenly the light can travel. And so this is the sort of classic, this is the Planck sort of legacy picture. It's now quite a few years old. Um, but this is showing the temperature, or not so much the temperature, it's a temperature differential um, across the night sky. And these fluctuations are down at around one part in about 100,000. Um, and so you have to sort of be able to measure exquisitely precisely a temperature, which means you've got to do some sort of spectral analysis to get a black body spectrum at all these different angles. Um, and then you look at the sort of what was that temperature and it's almost uniform at around 3 uh, Kelvin, but there are these tiny fluctuations. And those tiny fluctuations are the residual of those of a not quite purely smooth universe. So, so that's, this is kind of, you know, really, I, I don't know, it's just amazing anyway. Um, so what, when, that's pretty picture, but it doesn't sort of tell you quantitative science. So what do people do when they analyze it? Well, that's really not an oval. It's obviously the sphere of the night sky around us. And so what they do is they basically break it down into what we call spherical harmonics. So we look at each individual sort of scale. We, a dipole would be something that just went from one, it was maybe red in one half and blue in the other half, um, and, and so on and so forth. And so this is, this L is that, it, what labels that angular, angular number. 
and you start to plot the power, how big is the fluctuation in the microwave background at that angular scale. And what you see typically is there is always a peak. And that peak really sort of comes from a sort of acoustic resonance as this plasma becomes transparent. And it's sort of beforehand, while you've got the plasma, your, your molecules are kind of stopping the photons from, they're, they're sort of keeping all the photons uh, coupled and you know the photons are evolving like the baryons. The moment that switches off, the photons can move and it's kind of like a, the, the sort of characteristic size of the universe at that point is what sort of imprints on. And so you always get that first peak, but then the details, all the extra wobbles, those are sort of hidden in extra parameters like what, how much real matter have you got, how much total matter have you got, how much of something else do you have. And so here with some really nice animations from Wayne Hu, um, you can go and look at his web page. This is just giving you an example of why Planck say we tell you what the universe is. These are the parameters of the standard cosmological model. Because if you start changing things like the curvature or the amount of this lambda, as we're going to do it, so you see it becomes less or it becomes more, you see how these things start to shift. So if you, if you bring curvature, then this starts to shift to the right. And yeah, that's on the left. The one on the right, so there you're actually changing the, and I think this is the amount of the baryon, so this is the amount of normal matter. And so what happens is the odd peaks start to get enhanced, sorry. <laughs> the odd peaks get enhanced relative to the even ones. Um, and of course the initial peak just goes up. So it's, it's this sort of analysis that tells you something. It's not just telling you about those fluctuations. Looking at this, how those fluctuations, the detail of them, is telling you about the curvature of the universe. It's telling you about the normal matter content. It's telling you about the curvature. There's really a lot of information hidden in there. So then dark matter, which was mentioned before. Uh, if we look at our galaxies in detail, and this was done back in the 1930s, Zwicky noticed that if you looked at the sort of spe the spectrum of gas rotating around galaxies, that this would be, things were going too fast further out. It was as if there was more matter in the galaxy than was shining. He kind of called it dark matter. Um, but in fact, not only do we sort of feel that we need it in small scales, looking at our own galaxy, uh, I guess that always shows you galaxy small. Um, but in fact, if we want to explain how we got here, we also need it. So this was an amazing simulation. It's now nearly 20 years old, but it was just an incredible, it's this huge simulation Oh uh, gosh, one, two, ten billion, seventy-seven million, six hundred and ninety-six thousand particles in their simulation. So that you can see that they have this massive hierarchy of scales that they can delve into and right down to a point where they can say, well, you know, this is looks like what's happening for forming a galaxy. And so this is only a computer simulation, but nonetheless, if you add the, a certain, you know, they can test it for different amounts of dark matter, and this one was really the amount that was at the time consensus. Um, and it's really consistent with the, statistically speaking, with the structure that we see us around us today. And this is now again, you know, a lot of these telescopes are doing these very deep sky surveys going to, uh, you know, well, here it's only 0.14 in this picture. But, you know, you, what you see here is, again, these clustering of galaxies. You see voids. And so the structure is very much what you expect if you 
run that uh, simulation of a universe with some sort of general perturbation spectrum that looks like what we've got in the microwave background and with ingredients of dark matter. Finally, supernovae, which we heard about again before. <laughs> uh, rare, um, although probably, again, that depends on how you define rare. Um, and there are explosions of massive stars at the end of the lifetime. So you've already heard about that. Don't need to say it. Um, uh, but the thing that's great about them is they're so bright that we can see them from very far away. We can use them as standard candles, and therefore we can do a comparison between redshift and luminosity distance. And so that kind of gives us some sort of you know, way of taking our Hubble um, ruler, which would just say redshift was proportional to distance, and extending it further. So again, it's the type 1a supernovae, which have a very specific light curve. Um, and so, yeah. That's they get used as standard candles. And so just again, as a reminder, uh, redshift is simply this idea that the light, if we think of our light as just a nice wave on a balloon, we stretch the balloon, the wave gets stretched out, and that is, means it's, it's become redder. So that's our redshift. Now, I can never resist showing this because I'm sure that if I saw someone plot a straight line through that set of points, I, I, would, I would not be convinced. You know, five out of ten can do better type of thing. You know? Nonetheless, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's of course, a, you know, uh, there's some past history. Hubble's got credit for it, but there was also Slifer, I guess, during the teens, was also noticing the same phenomenon. Um, but it, it's certainly true that nearby we do have a roughly linear relation which then um, departs from linearity as we go further back in time. And so the supernova survey again is sort of taking a lot, just really essentially pointing a camera and looking for them. <laughs> um, but what's, what they're spotting is that our universe, that R of T, is accelerating. So in other words, our dot is our velocity, our double dot is our acceleration, and that is positive. Why is that puzzling? Well, Einstein's equations give us that the acceleration A goes like, or you know, sort of extra pieces, uh, and I've set C equal one here, so sorry, <laughs> always do, um, is equal to, is proportional to this combination of energy density and pressures. Now, the, the problem is all matter has rho plus 3p positive, normal everyday matter, because really you need to think of that rho as mc squared, so it's huge for normal matter. So normal matter, it's, it's almost always just rho. Radiation, a radiation gas would have a positive p, so it would be even bigger. So normal matter would make the universe decelerate, and yet what we see is exactly the opposite. And so that tells us that this rho plus 3p has to be negative, which unless we've got negative energy, tells us p has to be negative. So in other words, what we've kind of got is this strange energy source, which I, I guess I, I always like to say it's energy, Jim but not as we know it. <laughs> so, um, so that pressure has to be negative, which is called tension. Now, um, that's perhaps a little harder to get over if you haven't sort of, if you, your mind hasn't been used to sort of warp going around sort of all distorted space times. Um, but I guess one way of thinking about it is maybe a violin string. Um, and so the violin string obviously has an energy, and the, the lower the pitch, the G string has a much uh, bigger energy than the E string. But these are under tension because that's kind of how you're changing a pitch. Um, and so it's that sort of idea 
except the, the strange thing is that relativistically speaking, that tension is the same size as the energy. So it's like space is sort of being pulled apart. And of course, we know what that is. That is a cosmological constant if energy is minus uh, pressure. And so, again, this was where one of those sort of classic uh, Einstein's biggest blunder, he introduced it actually to get a static universe. He was well aware that his equations would give a dynamical universe, which in 1915 was, well, you know, he figured he'd be laughed out of court. So he introduced this term so he could get a static universe, which we now call the Einstein static universe, which was a sphere. Um, and so it, it goes into that Friedman equation and it changes the balance. And it all works perfectly if you just take things on trust. However, if we think about it from the perspective of that pizza, dark energy, don't know what it is. Let's call it lambda, fine. But where does it come from? Uh, dark matter, don't know what that is bit more ideas as a particle physicist because at least it's matter, at least it's a particle. We can go and look for it and people are looking for it. Um, and so the bit that we are made of, us, tiny, tiny slice, it's minuscule, 4%, 4% of the universe is stuff like this that we know that is describable by our standard model of particle physics. So that is a bit of a problem. <laughs> and so I'm now going to put a theorist's hat on and say a little bit about some of, you know, ideas of, well, why is it a problem? And then just briefly some ideas of, of what, what it does. OK. So here we have to delve into the vacuum because even if there's no matter, if you have a cosmological constant, then that term is still there. So if you like, it's telling you something about what happens when space is empty. So let's just briefly say a few words about that. Um, in counterpoint to uh, relativity, um, we also had the development of quantum physics last century. And again, Einstein was right in the thick of it. Um, and it describes, and this is incredibly successful, it describes all of our particle interactions, the small range forces of nature. And it also in, describes long range force of electromagnetism. And so these are usually grouped as a weak nuclear force, which is, I guess, describes radioactivity that sort of tells you how electrons and uh, nucleons interact. The strong nuclear force keeps nuclei together. That's a weird one. Um, and then, well, we know electromagnetism. We see light. We use, know a compass. We kind of, that one's no, no stranger. But the fact is, these are all described by a quantum field theory. And I, I don't know, every now and then I always like to give quotes. But this one, I think, is great from Neil Spohr. Um, <laughs> and it's really true. <laughs> Anyone who is not shocked by quantum mechanics has not understood it. It's just weird. <laughs> it's weird. So I'm not going to, I mean, I had, you know, I thought, shall I put slides in about quantum? No, no, let's not go too far. Uh, so I'll just say a few, the, the key points. So I think probably the thing that uh, you kind of, um, one of the main sort of things that, that happens is that your concept of a particle kind of is really blurred. You, you have this wave particle duality, as it was put forward by de Broglie. Um, and it's, this is also related to uncertainty, quantum uncertainty. Um, you can know where something is, but then you've no idea where it'll go next. Or you can know exactly where it's going, but no idea where it is. Um, so <laughs> uh, which somehow, I don't know, that sounds like a lot of my life, I have to say sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So, you know, and, or you can have a balance. You can say, well, it's roughly round about here and it's roughly not moving very fast. Uh, and that's this concept of uncertainty. And that fits very well with this idea of replacing a particle with a wave function, which is telling you something about probability of a particle being in a particular state or a particular place at a particular time. Um, and that then develops into quantum field theory. Sorry, I could, again, I can't resist some of these ones, which um, is, so a field, I mean, there's, again, this is a classic visualization. This is back from the 19th century, never mind 20th, uh, where the, the iron filings are tracing out magnetic field lines. So although if I were to write down, you know, sort of symbols on a piece of paper, people might sort of think, well, yeah, I don't really see that that's telling me anything. I think if you think of these quantum fields as this iron filing representation, then you can start to get a much sort of better visualization of what a field is. It, it's sort of saying that there's a value at every point in space at every, any time. And really, whenever we sit down to do any modern physics, this is the picture that we use. So the Higgs boson is a scalar field, which means it is a number <laughs> at every point in space and time. So a scalar field is just a number. But when I say number, I don't mean one, two, three, four. I don't even mean a complex number. It's usually sort of something a little, you know, even more complicated. But it is not, it, it's sort of just simply this sort of number in a more general sense. And so the Higgs itself defines our vacuum and it sort of weaves most, almost all the particles together in a, a, a sort of, I guess it's a complex, but it's well understood. So we kind of know how this all fits together. Um, and these patterns that we see when we do particle physics are all manifestations of this underlying number that we call the Higgs scalar. And so, you know, we have this, this sort of rather nice, uh, very compact, actually, set of interactions, which is the 4% of the universe. So I mentioned quantum uncertainty. And what that is essentially saying is that in the vacuum, we don't have nothing necessarily because we can have particle pairs, particles, antiparticles, coming into existence. And as long as they disappear before this uncertainty time, no problem. So the vacuum is really this sort of very seething mass of what we call virtual particles. Virtual because we never, they're not real. They don't, they don't sort of actually exist. And we can ask, what is the, it does that sort of background sort of flux, if you like, have any energy? And, and actually, yeah, we have a, a prescription. We can sort of compute that by saying, well, if we start off with a lambda, how do we change it? How does all this it's popping in and out of existence? What does it do? Um, how do we get a problem? Because the obvious or the naive value we would get for our lambda is um, rather big. It's, it's sort of right up at the scale, what we call a Planck scale, where, or just a very high scale, I should say, um, where, where essentially the universe would never even get to the point of being the quark gluon plasma if lambda were that big. So this is known as the cosmological constant problem. People, every now and then, a generation comes around and tries to work on it and tries to solve it and goes away with the tail between its legs type of thing. But uh, this is really the, the, um, the core, if you like, of uh, dark energy and modified gravity. So um, if we go back to thinking about that picture of the vacuum and thinking about the Higgs, which itself has a vacuum energy, uh, what we could instead do is say, well, suppose we've got another scalar, but not the Higgs. 
that um, is instead of just sitting there like the Higgs does, telling us what, uh, what the masses of the particles are, this scalar has it's got a vacuum energy that's just very, very slightly decreasing as the scalar value changes, then that scalar will just very, very slowly roll. And so the, the energy of it will gradually decrease and its pressure will be negative and almost the same as the energy, but not quite. And so what that does is it gives us an energy density, or a, what we would call an energy momentum, tensor in GR, that is almost a cosmological constant, but not quite. And so this is where this phrase of dark energy has come from. It's called dark because that scalar does not interact with the standard model particles, therefore it doesn't interact with a photon or light, therefore we don't see it. <clears throat> and its energy to sort of give, uh, to flag the fact that it is like the cosmological constant, it's an energy and a tension. So some descriptions of acceleration of the universe use this dark energy. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> it's not the only option. And so for some time, we've been thinking, uh, could we instead change gravity? Um, so there's various ways that we can do this. And I'll talk about one of them, the last one. Uh, but one of them, which seems to be perhaps one of the ways that's, that sort of people are perhaps digging into more now, that in essence, you can... Um, you can add, instead of adding a scalar that looks like matter, you can make a scalar kind of do things with the geometry. You can make interactions a lot more complicated. And I mean, it's got to the point where I guess, you know, sometimes I look at a paper and I think, you know, life's too short, you know. There's, so the, the interactions get super complicated. Um, but then also we have to take into account the impact of string theory, which, you know, really has done a great PR job at being the way to quantize gravity. So this is sort of the one where probably, I've done a little bit of the complicated bit, but it's probably the one I've done most of. So just very briefly, extra dimensions, yes, Doctor Who. Um, so you have it's, you know, the TARDIS, I think it was back at a Tom Baker one where he tries to explain how, you know, the, uh, how there are extra, it's, it's, ex it's bigger on the inside because it's going into extra dimensions. Sort of not too bad an explanation, actually. Um, so uh, just like we've got three space and one time, there's no reason that we couldn't have some extra spatial dimensions sort of floating around as long as we don't see them because we don't see them. How do we not see them? They can be extremely small. That's something called Kaluza Klein. Or we can glue ourselves to a sheet, effectively, that we live on some surface inside this higher dimensional space. And that's a really quite interesting concept because that allows our extra dimensions to be relatively big, which becomes quite useful. So a brain world, what it's called, is really just a slice on which we live. And we, because we're stuck to it, we can't see what's happening off the slice, but gravity can. Um, and so why that's useful is actually if gravity can see these extra bits, but normal physics, uh, particle physics can't, it makes gravity weaker because gravity sampling the whole space. So a bit like that inverse square being, you know, um, being one over R squared because of the area of um, spheres is increasing like R squared. This is sort of the same roughly idea uh, of gravity spreading out and getting weaker. So in a sense, we are flatlanders. And so that's really, if you have these extra dimensions, you get you obviously get changes in the small scale when you get sort of sufficiently at a high energy to sample the extra dimensions. But then what was interesting 
was myself with uh, two Russian collaborators, we shouldn't say it nowadays, uh, produced this model that uh, was a toy model for making gravity weak at very large scales. So here, this is our brain world, and then we have a funny space. It's, 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 far, it's not funny from the uh, gravity perspective, but it is a space that is what we would call negatively curved. And so if you visualize lines of force, it bends them back around. So very small scales, it, you see you're sampling the extra dimension, so you wouldn't see four-dimensional gravity. You go to intermediate scales, and gravity starts to look four-dimensional because all these lines of force have come back. Then you go to very large scales, and this is some additional sort of, um, sort of ghost brain, if you like, and, the, and gravity starts being able to, these force lines start being able to escape. So you start to see the extra dimension at very large scales. And so that sort of idea is, you know, you're modifying gravity on the small scale, which we call the UV, ultraviolet, as well as on a very large scale, which we call IR or infrared. And so we can get accelerating universes without dark energy by having modified gravity. So that's just a pictorial sketch about how it might work. It's, I've called, emphasized it's a toy model because it doesn't work. In the end, we found that it had a ghost, which is a catastrophic instability. Um, but it did show how, what was possible if you started to get quite inventive with either the way your universe is embedded or maybe you start altering gravity. So I'm going to just start closing by saying, can, you know, there are all sorts of weird and wonderful ways of, of sort of playing with particle physics or with gravity. Can we test them? You know, we, can we take it to anything to the bank? I've talked about how cosmology can potentially test some of these ideas. I just want to finish by talking about uh, you know, gravitational waves and strong gravity, because this is kind of where a lot of us who are interested in uh, modifications to gravity, it's what we're kind of starting to look towards as a way of testing it. So a gravitational wave is a ripple in space-time. Uh, it sort of crudely looks like that little gif on the side. And LIGO is an amazing piece of kit that can actually see, oh gosh, how much is it in that, in the, in the arm? It's, it's something like less than a fraction of a nucleus ch shift in, I mean, it's amazing what they can see. These are really, really tiny um, distortions. I don't know if you can hear that. But this is a black hole merging, and it's really best uh, done not so much as a light, but as a sound. And so you get this rumble, which is why the black holes are going round and round and gradually getting faster and faster. And then there's this choop, very characteristic chirp as they come together. And then there is the ring down at the end. So how can that test? Well, um, in 20, oh, there we get, August 2017, uh, they detected a merger event. But on analysis, at the same time, though, uh, the NASA's gamma ray telescope also detected a gamma ray burst. And at, obviously, they didn't know it at the time. But when they analyzed the merger, they realized these objects were a bit too light to be black holes. So they figured it was a neutron star. And then you get on the phone to your friends with the telescopes and say, did you, did you see anything? You know? And they realized that they'd both seen the same event. Now, you don't see anything in the electromagnetic spectrum when two black holes collide because there's no matter. It's all space-time. So this is what's really cool now. We can start to sort of look at the same event in completely sort of different using, you know, one's using gravity, one's using electromagnetism. Why is it important? 
within two seconds. What that is saying is that the speed of light, or, or rather gravitational waves, travel at the speed of light. Now, if you modify gravity too much, and some theories did, you start separating the speed of light and the speed of gravitational waves. So this one observation ruled out the majority, actually, <laughs> of modified gravity theories, just, just in one, one observation. I mean, so there's still plenty left, but it, it, is, it is a really strong constraint. So I think that's super impressive. So the, you know, it, it's this, this was the curve, uh, and that's, you know, that was just that one event had a big impact. Strong gravity? Well, in what we mean by strong gravity is really either very strong tidal forces or a, a sort of very strong gravitational event like an event horizon. So the event horizon of a black hole can, well, it really is in some sense a hole in space. Um, and so there's a lot of distortion near the black hole event horizon. Um, now, a black hole is black, so we can't directly see it. However, most black holes have some sort of gas or, say, a remnant of their partner star uh, around them, which then forms an accretion disk. And so that accretion disk can get extremely hot, and so it radiates. So in fact, usually the local environment of a black hole is quite luminous. Well, relatively, I suppose. Um, and so this is sort of the picture that, say, I might have grown, well, yeah, grown up with of a black hole. And it's beautiful, but it's completely wrong. And as I'm sure you're aware, because of course, like curves. So here is an example. This is a sort of toroidal type of accretion disk where, you know, some of the light is sort of significantly bent, but more or less comes straight to you. Some goes once around the black hole, some goes twice, some comes around the back. And then when you put it all together, what you actually see is not quite what is there from that altitude, longitude, latitude, the X, Y, Z perspective. So now this image is from interstellar, and this is pretty much uh, what you might see. Um, so it's, yeah, it's really pretty. Um, of course, that's not what uh, the astronomers see. This is what they see. Uh, we, we, we detect the black hole by the shadow in the middle, and this is what's causing, uh, you know, that, that uh, it's all that image. Um, so that was that, I didn't put the credit there, that was from the Event Horizon Telescope, which I guess you guys are very much aware about the resolution of a telescope and uh, sort of limit, um, the sort of diffractive limit. And so the bigger the baseline of your telescope, the better resolution you've got. And so they pop everything round the Earth, so they have a massive baseline. And then they do some amazing uh, analysis of the data because, of course, their, their, their network is sparse, so they have to sort of rebuild the signal. Um, and they get that, that image, which, which uh, I remember the media would not, not super impress. But why is it so fuzzy? You know, well, OK. Nobody can't please them, can you? Um, so this was just something that I, again, pulled off from various sort of invest, you know, we, we're playing with all sorts of different ways of modifying the local geometry. But here, what they're kind of doing is, here's Einstein's theory, what happens if you just tune the dial and make gravity weaker or stronger? And you kind of start seeing, you know, that the, the shadow starts to, to change, you know? So that's just, that was just meant to sort of indicate that, um, you know, that even just changing how strong gravity is starts to change the image. If you then change, uh, you know, you then even change things even more, you start to get sort of secondaries, you start to get sort of big distortions. So at the moment, 
we can't necessarily, the, you know, the images are still a bit fuzzy, but eventually we may be able to start um, investigating. So I think it's probably time because there was something about half nine mentioned. So let me just sort of um, wrap up. So our standard model of cosmology, I've been saying the things we don't understand. I didn't even get round to the Hubble tension. Um, but the, you know, there's, there's things we don't understand and that's, that's what makes it fun. But it's amazing what we can explain. You know, the fact that we can say so much about the matter content and, I'm, and, and we're pretty confident about that uh, because we kind of know where the limits of, of that picture are and what the assumptions are. Um, but it does rely on a lot of stuff that we're taking on trust. Dark matter, still looking for it. Um, I mean, in a sense, I guess we hope the LHC might find a clue to that, but it didn't. Um, dark energy is an even bigger puzzle. Um, but we do have ideas. It's not like we can't do it. And I think, you know, they, each of them works to some extent, but none, I think it's fair to say none work completely. Um, and so I think that, again, starting to mine these new observational tests, these new telescopes, the gravitation, gravitational wave ones, do give us more ways of exploring gravity, you know, at all scales. And then I didn't put any slides in, but the other th crazy thing that we're doing, and something I'm involved in, um, is we're testing gravity in the lab. We're building gravity simulators. Um, so we've, uh, we've just had our paper accepted in Nature, so we're feeling very, very pleased about that, uh, by sort of building a sort of analog black hole. So anyway, I'll stop there, and I, you can ask questions, although I do need to get a train at some point. Thank you very much indeed, Ruth, for a fascinating presentation. And uh, I'm sure many of us will have thought, uh, I'd like to find out more about this if you can. Uh, I used to ask years ago, do we actually need dark matter, dark energy, mm. or do we need a better understanding of gravity? Um, yeah. yeah, so I think that, so again, that's something that I think we're much more confident about mm. than we might have been 20 years ago. So uh, the modified Newtonian gravity or MOND was, if you like, one attempt by changing, uh, modifying Newtonian dynamics. Uh, of galaxies, you could maybe get away with the galactic rotation curves. But the point is dark matter is not just in galaxies. It's, yeah. it's also part of structure formation. It's also part of the microwave background spectrum. And also, if we, um, if we do, sorry, I just got worried that this was going off again. Um, if, if we do the, uh, I've lost a train of thought now. Uh, yeah. Bullet cluster, that's what I'm trying to say. You must want a drop of water. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, the bullet, so, I mean, if we also look where we've had, um, there's this famous bullet cluster where there's been a collision of galaxies, but if you actually look at lensing, so this is why now lensing surveys are so important, because they're looking for things we can't see with light, but we can see through the ways they distort images behind them. And so lensing surveys tell us about the matter distribution that we don't see. And again, this, this bullet cluster, it seems like, you know, you can see how the matter has interacted, but you can also see from the, uh, from this sort of, I guess the lensing, the gravitational potential reconstruction that the dark matter's just, you know, gone through. So, so I think, um, I mean, I'm more optimistic about dark matter. I think it, you know, it's just some sort of dark sector, extra particle sector that we just, you know, sort of decoupled back near the beginning of the universe and we just don't see it now. Hmm. Okay, do we have any questions from the floor? One here. <coughs> 
Thanks for a fascinating talk. Um, you showed a graph about the supernova cosmology project, you know, mm. the curve going out, and it's very, very tight it's error bars. On, yeah. Do, do you how certain are we that we don't un we understand supernovae well enough, or can we explain that away? Um, so it's I guess it's not that sort of gives us the distance ladder. I th I would say it is a it's probably you could find people you know it's probably still slightly open question, but I think the the consensus is definitely coming down on the side of yes, I think we've more or less got it right. So they've tried to sort of look more closely at the spectra, I think, and they've thought about, well, if the younger supernova, the closer younger ones, you know, did something different to the further older ones, you know, would that change it? And, and it doesn't, it's not really, lambda is not going away. So, um, so I think, it, you know, it, it is a question that they've thought about, and they have applied that to their analysis. Nothing's perfect, of course, but, um, but I think there's a lot more confidence than there was perhaps when the plot was made, because <laughs> this is now legacy stuff, yeah? Yeah. Exactly. Mm. yeah. You put up the diagram near the start of your talk, which shows the universe going through the sort of curve where it goes whoosh and then levels out and then starts to expand again at the mm, end. The picture, yeah, yeah. With, yeah the Why trumpet. the bit in the middle? Why did it not expand, keep expanding straight away? Sort of what made dark matter, dark <laughs> energy, whatever, sort of hang about a bit for a few billion years before deciding it wanted to go? Well, it was expanding all the time, right? So I think that, that possibly... Um, I think that straight bit is meant to indicate um, that, yeah, that it's maybe just not accelerating as much. So essentially, you know how the, so crudely speaking, you've got um, a matter content where the pressure is insignificant compared to the energy density because the energy density is multiplied by C squared. Um, so you know how that evolves, you know how radiation evolves, you know, in terms of how does the energy decay, fall off as you expand, and you know lambda stays roughly constant. And so, I, I mean, maybe, maybe it's the picture that's at fault more than anything else, but uh, let's face it, the universe expands by such a stupendous amount, <laughs> it would be hard to be completely accurate. And I think the point of the of the picture is more to show that the, the, the sort of trumpet flaring at the end, um, it's perhaps not to be, you know, what, what's, what's the phrase they put on maps not to scale or something? Um, okay, yeah, I yeah. think that's, but it's a fair point, yeah. Thank you. Um, the uh, possibility that uh, whatever blew the universe into being, that uh, some of the components probably went on ahead. <laughs> that, and maybe we don't see those components, and maybe that's where most of the dark matter went. We'd never know about it, or we'd never see it. Yeah. Sounds this sounds suspiciously like a Star Trek plot. <laughs> Things being out of phase. So. <clears throat> well. I mean, in some sense, obviously, the Big Bang all starts at the same time, right? Yes. Um, but I think the I, I think that so as I said, I, I I'm not so worried about dark matter because um, I think it's a lot easier to conceive of uh, a sort of particle physics um, model where you have the stuff that we know, the baryons. And then there's a sort of almost like a replica of it, but the two don't talk to each other. Yes. So it's a bit like what you said, out of phase, yeah. So dark matter does attract baryonic matter, because we see that with the um, movement in uh, spiral galaxies. Gravitationally, yeah. Gravitationally, mm -hmm. they do interact. Mm, that's how they interact, yes. yeah. But not via exchange of these virtual particles. Mm. Yes. That's the, yeah. So th the other question is, how does dark matter interact with dark matter? I don't know, because well, we don't I know what it is. <laughs> I think we have some yeah. clues. 
Um, is it Professor Alan Guth uh, mm. noted a, an early epoch rapid expansion? Inflation. Uh, he, mm. he said he doesn't really understand what caused it. So it's interesting because um, we, <laughs> if you if you hear the sort of the canon, right of of cosmology people will say inflation happened, right, to, to um, make the universe flat, etc. cetera. Um, yet we don't, have, we don't have a model that, say, everybody would, a consensus model. It's a paradigm rather than an explanation still. Um, and people like myself who are more gra coming from the gravity stable, what we don't like, I mean, what we don't like is the fact that, in f that the, the, the description involves this split saying that space, that you've got this classical background and then you're quantizing stuff over it, uh, whereas we sort of feel it's quantum gravity, it should be holistic, right? Um, on the other hand, the calculations that you do using that split and that approach tell really good. They, they explain exactly what we see. So it's really clear that that very, um, I would call it sort of empirical belt and braces type of approach is capturing some of the truth that maybe, you know, at, this is why we keep trying to find really what quantum gravity is so that we could Thank put you. it on a firm foundation. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, this might be the stupid question. Um, this is more to clear my own mind, because the way that people show um, redshift and everything else, it's always explained, the way I understand it, is things that are further away travelling faster. But isn't actually the fact that the older they are, they were travelling less, and it's actually us moving away from them, because we're actually... Because it's always done like the red shit is they're moving away from us, whereas in fact we're moving away from them. We yeah. are moving away from each other. Yeah, but yeah. that's the rel yeah. Yeah. So relative. Yeah, relative. The way we say like you've got the flare, it's actually yeah. the fact that it's actually us that are moving faster than them. I just want to get that clear. In well, my mind. <laughs> neither of us are moving in some sense. It's the space in between that's expanding. And that's where, that's where it's supposed to really, you know, that's why I say it's uh, one of the hardest things I've found with, you know, these experiments I was saying at the end is I've got to start, uh, go step back where T actually means time and things mean what they are, you know, because I've got so used to everything just being, you know, uh, so wibbly wobbly. Yeah, I've got a question. You've talked about quantum gravity a couple of mm. times. When, when you talk about quantum gravity, you also talked about gravity being the distortion of space-time mm. and matter. So is, is quantum gravity an exchange of some sort of particle, or is it just that space-time is curved in steps? We don't know. Um, that's, I mean, so, I mean, um, some people w try and develop a description where space-time becomes discrete. Um, others have got, again, you know, one of these quite complicated ways of sort of trying to extract things, um, I'm not sure how I would put it, uh, sort of things that we'd normally associate with geometry, I guess. They're trying to sort of make that more, you know, find something where you can sort of meaningfully quantize it. Uh, string theorists would say, well, actually, everything is a string, and space-time are just fields living on the string. And so it's some, that's sort of naturally a quantized picture. But, but actually, string theory does explain very uh, weak, sort of weak gravity, small interactions, but, but n somehow it still doesn't explain a, a standard black hole that we have, yeah. So. 
I think we've got time for about one I'm more question. Yeah. I'm sort of interested on this. Yeah. Sorry, the, 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 the um, uh, spin two fields, because I, um, if you take um, MTW, uh, Mizzen Orthogonal Wheel, uh, and, and, and Wheel Arc, so they, they have um, a, de a, de a description in the gravitation book of the spin two fields, and they derive the Einstein field equations from the spin two fields. Okay, in fact, I have it, I have it all in here. They, they, they do an infinite series, and they, right? So the question is, and, and, and they basically make a comment that you, you've got two alternatives. You can look at gravity as being um, a, a curvature of space, or the spin two field just make, says that the times and the you know, in our clocks and rulers all go, go off. So the spin two is sort of using this idea of particles having an internal or an intrinsic spin. So the way a scalar has spin zero, the electron has spin a half, the photon has spin one, the graviton, which we might call a unit of gravitational radiation, would have spin two. And so that's, it's, it's sort of, uh, that is because it is a quadrupole, um, yeah, a quadrupole wave. The point is, is that... You, so they, they do the outline of the calculation and show that you get the Einstein field equations by using this approach. Okay, I'll, I'll show you afterwards. Right? And, I'm and, sorry, I do have oh, to so, catch oh, a train. But the so question then is, is, is um, um, oh, I've lost it now. <laughs> um, the, 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 uh, now it'll take too long to, to, to get to the, <laughs> to, okay. to get to okay. the point. <laughs> but what's really getting to the point is that. On, on these modified, all these different f f mm. um, theories of using modified, modified gravity, yeah. mm -hmm. um, the problem are, uh, is there any, are people using general principles to try and say how they're going to modify it, or just put in, well, I'll just put in these extra terms in the equation? Oh, gosh, no, it is, it is using the framework. It's very much using the framework that we, st we use for gravity, general relativity, the framework we use for particle physics. So, uh, for example, uh, making massive gravity, where that spin two particle now becomes massive, that was really hard. Um, so, uh, so Claudia Duram and Gregory Gabadadze and Andrew Tully cracked that problem. So it's not just... It, Sometimes it can sound like we're just having what, fun, what, what I mean but we're not. It, we're, so, we're, so, we're following so, 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 rules. Um, and we're have to, oh, sorry. Okay. To hold. Sorry. Right there. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to say just uh, one, one thing, though. On the, the subject of the expansion of the universe um, that you showed the balloon module, for example, and s the galaxies are getting further away from each other because space itself is expanding. So have you been asked why aren't the galaxies themselves also expanding at the same time? So let me just use your, just for the people on Zoom. No, I think that's a, good, that's a good question. And I think it's, again, a question of scale because the galaxies are sort of also made out of matter and being held together. So the effect of the expansion at the galactic scale is kind of small. But this is something like we do think about when we want to think about black holes put in a cosmological setting and how much does the expansion affect the black hole. So it's, it's a good question. Yeah. Thanks. Um, right. And... Uh, <laughs> right. By the way, uh, some years ago, uh, I actually met... Uh, Peter Higgs and I said that I had been saying for some years that when we find the Higgs boson we should celebrate with a cocktail to be known as the Large Hadron Collada. <laughs> right, I'm going to hand over to... Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, then. I don't think I can follow that joke there. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, right. Let's bring the meeting to the end. Uh, a few messages for you. First of all, a big thank you to everybody who's been coming along to the events that we've been holding. Various schools, the Hartford Dark Skies, all those things. Volunteers, you are very 
much appreciated. And talking to volunteers, if anyone's got a telescope and wants to come along to Bayfordbury on Friday and risk the elements, um, you'll be very welcome. Richard and myself are, are there. We may have Keith. Um, one or two others might be very welcome. And even if it's cloudy, we should be able to show you Saturn. And if you want to know how we do it, you'll have to turn up. <laughs> Okay, um, what else have we got? Just a few more things to say. The next meeting we've got here is on April the 10th about Island Zero. That's about a project, Island One, about looking into the future for a long, long way. What's going to happen when perhaps our Earth is uninhabitable? Okay, ideas at the moment before you get Island One, though, you've got to have the structure to build it. And Jerry is going to give us a talk about that. So put that date in your diary. You'll get messages about it. April the 10th. Um, perhaps not the most exciting thing, but a very important one on May the 15th is our AGM. And that's where we look for volunteers to come and join the committee. Um, we have mentioned it on one of the newsletters. It will get a, a few more mentions, and we've got one volunteer already said that they're willing to take over the role of secretary. Um, fabulous, you know, really, really pleased about that because it's a hard job to fill. So, you know, many, many thanks. But for anybody else is considering, wants to come on the committee, don't be shy, step forward, ask. We'll tell you what it's all about. That's May the 15th. Also on the last newsletter, there was a bit that was saying, have you got any ideas for us? Do, any speakers you would like us to get hold of? So if you've got some sort of burning interest, you'd say, wish they give a talk on that. Well, tell us and we'll try and find one. But please don't ask for conspiracy theories, because when that was asked for, yeah, we did get a speaker, and it was the most riotous meeting we've ever had. So I don't want that again, right? <laughs> and just finally to say the bring and buy on our website, there is a bring and buy page. If you've got some equipment that you can bear to part with, and you're looking for a good home for it, you can advertise it for nothing. But we need to know about it. Just drop us an email, a couple of photos, what do you want, and your contact details. We'll pop it on there. And of course, my telescope doesn't work. This is a fabulous talk. Jerry takes you through some of the problems that telescopes exhibit. And believe me, every one of us has had those problems. Yeah, I can see a few nods going around the room there. Now, if you've still got one sitting under the stairs and it's not doing anything other than gathering dust, if you want to find out how to work it, come along to Bramfield Village Hall on Saturday, bring your telescope and somebody will cast their magic over it and you'll go away a very happy person. Well, as long as it's all there and we can do that with it. So thank you very much indeed for all of you for coming along this evening. Thanks for bearing with the one or two technical hitches we had at the beginning. A uh, very big thank you to all the committee and everybody who made tonight possible. Um, Dan's done a fantastic job down here sorting out things and computers which were hiccuping and causing all sorts of problems. We hope it wasn't too visible to you and we hope those of you, if you're still there on Zoom, um, well, hope you got through it all. Have a safe journey home and I look forward to seeing you at one of our future meetings. Thank you and good night. <laughs>